I salam alaikum. In the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, I bear witness there is no God but Allah, and that Muhammad is his messenger. We'd like to greet everyone with the greeting words of peace of I salam alaikum. We'd like to welcome everyone to Atlanta, Georgia, to the Atlanta Civic Center to hear what we've been waiting on for a long time. And right now, is that right? A long time. All praise is due to Allah. So we want to get right into our program and we want to open up our meeting with a Muslim prayer by our student minister, Chester Muhammad, and we'll have a Christian prayer right behind it by Reverend Cabo. So if we can get everybody to stand at this time. And we pray in the name of Allah, the beneficent, the merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the beneficent, the merciful, master of this day of judgment in which we now live, thee alone do we serve and to thee alone do we beseech for help. Guide us on the right path, the path of those upon whom thou hast bestowed favors, not the path of those upon whom thine wrath is brought down, nor those who go astray. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, Mother God, we'll assemble here within your presence. Open up us to your presence so that our minds may be expanded and we can reap your mercifulness and your beneficialness that will allow us to grow and become a community of love, inclusiveness, growth, and development. In the name of your son Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the shoulders on of our ancestors, let the people of God say amen. amen. You may be seated. All praise is due to Allah. Well, once again, brothers and sisters, we'd like to welcome you to the mighty city of Atlanta, Georgia. And as I said before, we have heard what everybody else had to say. But now we're here today to hear what Farrakhan has to say. Is that right? All praise is due to Allah. Let's let Farrakhan set the record straight on who are the real children of Israel. So at this time, we want to bring to the rostrum our student Southern Re Regional Representative who's responsible for putting this event on and filling up this house. Let's bring him to the rostrum with a thundering round of applause. Our brother, student Regional Minister, Abdul Sharif Muhammad. Bring him on with a round of applause. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. At that window, there is no God but Allah. Muhammad is the message. As-salamu alaykum. And on behalf of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan, I'd like to welcome all for coming out tonight to hear the greatest speech that Donald Louis Farrakhan said he would be making. And I want to just thank Allah for each one of you taking time out of your schedule to come in here from a man of God. And I'd like to thank everybody on the dais for coming out tonight. And I really want you to listen tonight. Yes, More than applaud, I want us to listen. Because Don Lewis Farrakhan has a message from God for all of us. So I, I'm not here to teach. I just want to just welcome everybody. I really enjoy you all. So enjoy yourself while you're here. Well, I want to introduce this at this time. Reverend Dr. Barbara Kane to come up and have a few words to say from Hillside Chapel Truth Center. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Namaskar. I behold the divinity in you. I am so honored and humbled to be asked to just speak a few words tonight. So to our minister, Louis Farrakhan, and his family, to all of you of this great nation of Islam, to the many friends and honored guests who are here, 
we are glad to be together tonight on one accord. Many of you may not know that I have been a follower of the leadership and the teachings of Minister Farrakhan for over 40 years. Beautiful, beautiful. I lived in Chicago, Illinois for a number of years, and I met him through my minister and my mentor, the Reverend Dr. Johnny Coleman at Christ University Temple yeah. in Chicago. Yeah. And just to give you a little history, when you opened your restaurant at 86 in Cottage Grove, I lived right behind that restaurant and ate there quite frequently. <laughs> so you know, I, I have a little history on me here. But I'm, I'm reminded of his recent interview that was held with Kathy Hughes at TV One. And as I sat there and realized that God appoints his people to do what has to be done in the world in which we live today. And so I, I, I listened to his words of wisdom and I realized that we really have one of the greatest visionaries in the world in our presence here tonight. And so I speak these words in peace and in love and in thanksgiving because when you have a job to do, when God gives you something to do, you have to do it. And it's not a lot of people who can talk about the conditions of the world. And Mr. Farrakhan always tells us what's happening in the world. If you never read a book, if you never look at television, if you never talk to your neighbor, if you listen to the minister, you gotta know what's going on. And so I give thanks to stand here as the minister of a church that is international, that is interreligious, that serves all people. So wherever I am, I'm at home. So I thank you for this opportunity. I thank the minister for his words and the wisdom that he will give us tonight. And I thank all of you and I say to you, I love you and I appreciate you and I bless you and I thank God for all of us. We love you too. All praise is due to Allah. Come on now, you can do better than that. Dr. Reverend Barbara King, let's give a thundering round of applause. Come on now. All praise is due to Allah. Next, we have our brother who's the president of the Metro Atlanta Concerned Black Clergy. He opened us up with, his, with prayer. Now he's coming right back for his comments. Let's bring him on with a thundering round of applause. Our brother, Dr. Reverend Richard Cabo. Bring him on to the rostrum with a round of applause. As-salamu alaykum. As-salamu alaykum. As-salamu alaykum. Just want to see if you're alive in the house. All praise be to Allah. All right. Let's give Allah a great big hand. All right. I bring you greetings from the officer and the board of directors of Concerned Black Clergy of Metro Atlanta whereas we have been in existence for 27 years around homelessness and hunger. We welcome Minister Louis Farrakhan to this city here because of all the voices that are being heard. We have a question that we ask at Concerned Black Clergy, who will be the prophetic voice? that will speak on behalf of the hurting people and the people who are disconnected from the system so that we might be able to grow and develop the way God will want us to be. And so we bring greetings from our illustrious concerned black clergy at Metro Atlanta. But on a personal note, I arrived here in Atlanta some 30 years ago and the first public gathering 
where the Muslims was able to come and share their vision with the people of our community was at the Wheat Street Baptist Church where the Reverend Dr. Williams home border was the pastor. He received a lot of flack from the brethren and sisters of this city because he was able to open the doors to the Muslim. But for a personal note, about five years ago, Minister Louis Farrakhan came to Atlanta and visited concerned black clergy. At that time, I served as vice president of mission. And on this June the 26th, 2010, I serve as a seventh president of concerned black clergy. So I want to leave this momentum so that we will always have a, mem uh, a memorial of this historical occasion so that you can see that we put words and we put pictures where words are and we can show the folk that we are in unity with the Muslim as part of concerned black clergy. Let's give all our hand. Thank you. All praise is due to Allah. Give it up once again for our brother, Dr. Reverend Richard Cobble. At this time, brothers and sisters, we'd like to bring to the rostrum. At this time, we'd like to bring to the rostrum our brother, let's bring him right on, the Reverend Pelt. Let's bring him to the rostrum with a round of applause. Right. <clears throat> God bless you today. We are blessed to come. In fact, my president uh, just addressed you uh, from the concerned black clergy. We also come bringing greetings to you from Liberty Baptist Church downtown Atlanta, just right around the corner from Wheat Street Baptist Church. But we have come a long way as we reach out and venture to do new things, to work together because we have some common enemies in our community. And the enemy, the enemy is so gigantic that we can't be limited with limited faith. So it honors us to come and to share in this setting by being here and especially uh, to be invited to give some words to you as we move forward. It's an honor to anticipate Minister Farrakhan and the legacy he already has. And it is a joy to anticipate the energy, the vision that he brings to us. And I, I just wanted to say thank you for giving me this privilege uh, as a leader in the community to join you in this great day of hope as we live in the ocean of despair. All the issues, surely the oil and more than the oil, the drugs, the gangs and all that we deal with in our communities. I feel very hopeful this evening as I anticipate hearing a word from Minister Farrakhan. God bless you. God keep you. Be Thank blessed. You. Thank you. Thank you. Come on now, let's give it up. Reverend Pell. all praise is due to Allah. So at this time, we would like to bring to the rostrum the National Assistant, to the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Let's bring him on with a round of applause. Student Minister Ishmael Muhammad. All praises be to Allah. Hi, salam alaikum. One more time. Hi, salam alaikum. Those of us in 2010 that are still unfamiliar with those words, they, meant, they simply mean peace be unto you. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and thanks for his many blessings, his many gifts, his goodness, and his mercy to the human family. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan teaches us, and it is verified 
and confirmed in our scriptures that we read that whenever God punishes a people or before he punishes the people, he always raises up one from among the people to teach, to lead, to guide, and to warn. So we thank Almighty God, Allah, for all of his prophets and messengers from Abraham to Moses, to Jesus, to Muhammad, peace be upon these worthy servants. But none of us in this listening audience never met a man named Abraham. We never met Muhammad, Jesus, or Moses. But today, you will meet the prophets in one that God has raised up from a people who are considered no people at all. We are living in a time such as there never has been and never before to be equaled. The prophecies are being fulfilled before our very eyes. There's a leak in the Gulf that is destroying the life of the sea. I think I read that somewhere in the scripture that death would, be, would come upon the waters of the earth. Torrential rain. We are witnessing winds and tornadoes, earthquakes in diverse places, violence and bloodshed and fratricidal conflict is the order of the day. There are wars and rumors of wars and children are rising up in disobedience and rebellion to their parents and the scriptures tell us that children will even be killing their parents in the last day and the parents will be killing their own children. We are living in the last days. The last days of a world that God gave over to Satan to rule but now that his time is up we see the breakup of his world the breakup of the society we see calamities and so we are here today to bear witness that God has not forsaken us the man that we are about to behold is a man that God himself has anointed for this time. We thank Allah for his divine leader, teacher, guide, and warner to the nations of the earth, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And as I close, the man Jesus that we read of in the Bible had a very difficult job. His job was to expose the wickedness, the evil, and the hypocrisy in leadership. He had a hard job because he had to bring the truth, no matter what the consequence, because it is time for the people to be free and we're living in the time that Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Are you ready to be free from the truth that God is about to reveal to us today in the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan? Thank you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. Praise be to Allah. Brother Ishmael Muhammad. At this time, brothers and sisters, we just got a, just a few more minutes. You can hold on, is that right? We want to bring to the rostrum right now our brother, who's been a strong supporter of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan right here in Atlanta, Georgia. Let's bring him to the rostrum, Dr. Reverend Durley. Let's bring him to the rostrum right at this minute. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. God is good and God is good all of the time. Tonight we are glad, even though I am a Christian minister, Minister Farrakhan has ministered to me, uplifted me, 
turn my eyes to understanding of truth. And tonight is a great night in the city of Atlanta, Georgia. For many years, he has spoken truth to power. And it's only when we as African people understand the power of God. Tonight, all of you who are here, we are being blessed by one who has been anointed by Allah, by God, to speak truth to us. And we are called to listen. But not only listen, a lot of black folks just listen. But after you listen, what are you going to do? We are called to mobilize and actualize and do something to turn our people around. So tonight is the night when the minister speaks that we all come together, Christians and Muslims, to understand, and black folks, to do what God has called us to do. So tonight I bring you greetings from the concerned black clergy of Atlanta, all of us who work so diligently with minister Sharif here in the city and all of those here in Atlanta, that we join forces for the uplifting and the encouragement of us as a people. Tonight is the night that we continue to speak truth to power. He spoke truth years ago when a young, light-skinned black man with big ears was talking about running the country, and now everything he said is coming true, and we've got to honor that. Minister Farrakhan spoke truth to power. Tonight we join forces in that. So we thank you for allowing us, and we just welcome you to the city of Atlanta on behalf of the clergy here in the city of Atlanta. We are all one in the power of God. So let us enjoy, let us relax, let us lift up, and most of all, let us learn, and after we learn, let us do something. All praise is due to Allah. So right now, brothers and sisters, we want to bring right to the rostrum our sister who's a state representative here in the Georgia House of Representatives. Let's bring her to the rostrum with a round of applause, Sister Roberta Abdul Salam. Assalamu alaikum. Greetings to all of you brothers and sisters in the struggle and in the faith. I am so very honored to be able to address you yet again. The last time the minister was here at the Civic Center, I had the great honor, and I appreciate you so very much. I am the representative for the Clayton County, Fayette County District 74, and I will tell you that all over the world, people are talking about the fact that we no longer have public transit. It's a moral issue, it's a human rights issue, and I'm hoping that we can get the support of the community of brothers and sisters here because we have to change these e events and we have to turn it around and we're going to keep fighting the fight, but I also expect you to keep fighting the fight with me. I appreciate you and I greet you in the name of love and peace. Salam alaikum. Praise be to Allah. Well, we're right at that moment, brothers and sisters. What we all came to hear tonight. Books say, on this man have I laid the key. And when you lay a key on a man, it say this man. One of the definitions for this and that phrase is an adjective. And it's described at this moment, at this time. We are pointing to a man, on this man have I laid the key. And when you give a key to somebody, you give them an answer. Another definition for key is a blueprint. Another definition for key is an example. And I think we got an example, an answer, and a blueprint in the man that we're about to see who gives us a blueprint of how a free black man and woman should act in not only in America, but all over the world. On this man have I laid the key. Praise be to Allah. <laughs> Y'all all right? <laughs> On this man, the man whom the book in the scriptures talk about. When you read the scriptures, you're not reading about just anybody out of air. You're reading about a man who's come at this time. You're reading about a man who's come in the fulfillment of time. 
You're reading about a man who has come not to see that what you're talking about, but to, you're looking at a man that that which is fulfilled in both Bible and Quran. You're going to see a man in front of you in just a few minutes. As the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say, when you see him, look at him. Is that right? When you hear him, listen to him. Huh? Everywhere he say go, go. Wherever he say stay from, stay from. Because his preaching is a bearer of witness of what Allah revealed to me and of himself. And he said that was our brother, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I hear the motorcycles in the back. That's letting you know that he's here. So we want to bring up our regional representative to bring him right to the rostrum. Let's bring back our brother, Abdul Minister, Sh Minister Abdul Sharif Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. This <laughs> Malah Rahman Rahim. I've been with it. There's no God but Allah Muhammad. Look, as we speak, we have 13,765,400 people listening to the Honorable Louis Farrakhan when he come on. So are you ready? Well, what I would like to see, read just one verse from the Bible called Second Chronicle. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Now I'd like for everybody to get on your feet. And if you're ready to hear from the Honorable Minister Lewis Farrakhan, I want you to let him know that you want to hear from the Honorable Lewis Paracon, stand up, hey, be good. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and we give him thanks for his mercy and his goodness to the members of the human family that whenever any member of the family strays from his straight path and earns his wrath before he punishes, he always raises from among a people, that people, a messenger or a prophet to whom he gives what is called divine revelation by means of which he guides that people from the path of error back to his straight path that they may once again come into his divine favor. As Muslims, we believe in all of the prophets and we thank Allah for each and every one of them. We believe in Moses and the Torah and the Israelite prophets that gave us what is called the Old Testament. We believe in Jesus and the gospel. And we believe in the apostles who gave us the New Testament. 
We believe in Prophet Muhammad ibn Abdullah who gave to us and through the Muslims to the world the last revelation to come to the world, the Holy Quran. I am a student of the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and I could never thank Allah enough for his intervention in the affairs of black people in America in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, the great Mahdi who came among us and raised one from among us to be his messenger, Messiah to us, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. I greet all of you, my dear and wonderful brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language. Assalamu alaikum. My thanks, my deep gratitude to Minister Sharif and the laborers and believers of Mosque Number 15 for their very hard, diligent work that made this night possible. My thanks to all of those who helped Mass Number 15 from Chicago and other places. Thank you to the FOI and the MGT who always travel wherever I am to secure me and make sure that I am safe. I thank each and every one of you. My thanks to the distinguished brothers and sisters who are on this rostrum. Words cannot express how honored I am by your presence and uh, those who spoke before I came. I thank you for your words and I pray that tonight will be the beginning of an earth-shaking movement of Christians and Muslims and Hebrews working together for not only the liberation of our people in America, but working for the liberation of all humanity from the blinding touch of Satan who has deceived the entire world. Thank you all for your attendance. Thank you for the tickets that you purchased and the charity that you gave. Words are just not adequate. You love me and... and But like our great and esteemed brother, the late Michael Jackson used to always say, when I said, I love you, Michael, he said, I love you more. <laughs> and so I love you more because I'm willing to give my life to see our people free, justified and equal, and I'm willing to give my life to end the world of Satan and to bring in the kingdom of God that was prophesied to come through us. Why, Farrakhan, did you choose Atlanta to ask such a profound question, who are the real children of Israel? Atlanta is the capital city of the South. And before we leave tonight, 
if it is the will of Allah. My beloved brothers and sisters in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, Texas, Tennessee, South Carolina, North Carolina, Arkansas, you all will know the price that our ancestors paid in this South to bring wealth and riches to America, England, and the Western world, all of it was built on our backs. I don't want to waste any time. I asked the question, who are the real children of Israel? And I'd like to answer it right away. Go ahead, dear minister. Like any good lawyer in a courtroom, <laughs> he tells you what he's going to prove. All right. And then he goes ahead and proves it and let the jury make the decision. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad has said that Almighty God Allah revealed to him that the black people of America are the real children of Israel. And they, we, are the choice of God. And that unto us he will deliver his promise. This question says that somebody yes, sir. has usurped our position. That's right. This question says that somebody has taken the promise of God to the children of Israel and claimed it for themselves. Claimed it. But those of you biblical and Quranic scholars today we are prepared. Go ahead, to call out the scholars call out. of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. If you can disprove what we say today, then I'll pay with my life for lying. To all of those who feel that the children of Israel are over in that place they call Israel, you are mistaken. mistaken. To the Christian right who feel that if you bless that Israel, you will be blessed. But for over 60 years, that nation has not been blessed. But these are the people that if you bless us, then God will take off of America some of the plagues that are now coming on America that will get worse after I deliver this message tonight. My declaring this, I know will divide scholars, theologians, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, but it is time now that a proper dialogue be set up to answer the question that I've raised and answered. It is time for the scholars to sit down and listen to and look at scripture and prophecy to find out who is that last one that would usher in the kingdom and bring about the end of this present world. Teach, 
Most of us talk about white supremacy, but we have never understood the architecture of white supremacy. Therefore, we continue to be victims of it because the light of truth has not shown the root of white supremacy. Once the light of the sun strikes the root of the tree, the tree dies. And what has happened to black people and white people and Jews and Gentiles is that a small group, small group, 10% have deceived and misused 85% of the people and sucked their blood to live in luxury at the expense of those who do not understand the law of cause and effect and believe in a mystery God and a poison animal eaters but the wickedly wise have known the truth and because they know the truth and they know the time they are working night and day to trick you out of the promise of God and take you down to hell with them because the time of their end has come. The architecture of white supremacy has never been brought to the table to be discussed. The architecture of white supremacy will have to be exposed so the tree of white supremacy can die and the tree of humanity can live. Who are the draftsmen and the architects of such an idea that has dominated our planet for the last 4,000 years? Our historical research department has studied from the scholarship of Jewish historians, scholars, and rabbis. And we have published volume number two of The Secret Relationship between blacks and Jews. It goes on sale tonight. And in it, you will discover the architecture and the architect. You will read things that you never knew before. Things that you thought you understood but our research team has discovered and uncovered what has been hidden in books that you would never read. But we have read it. Yes, sir. Yes, we have. Come on, Minister. And now the scholarship is available. Last night, I sent this book. And another one that's printed called Negroes at Auction. I sent it to Mr. Abraham Foxman of B'nai B'rith. To all the leaders of the major Jewish organizations. I sent it to President Obama. To Rahm Emanuel to David Axelrod, to Timothy Geithner, to Larry Summers, to Ben Bernanke, to all the people that should know what was done to us and can no longer hide. That's why Jesus said, you shall 
know the truth and the truth shall set you free what truth shall you know if you are not yet free and you are not then you know, do not yet know the truth that Jesus was talking about that would free you from your open enemy. Awaken you. Cleanse you. And reconnect you to the God who has come for your and my salvation. I'll get into more of this during the lecture, but it's too much. You'll have to get the book yourself. Now after, I'm sending it of course to, to all these uh, talking heads. Hannity and Combs and Glenn Beck and Larry King. And everybody that talks. Sending it to Negroes. We're sending it to black college presidents. And then we can talk. Don't call me to come on no radio or television show until you have read the book. And then if you can defend this, we know who you are. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are Satan. And I'm exposing you. Because there is no hiding place today. The truth will be made so plain that even a fool will not find place to error. This is the day. This is the time, and I am the man to bring it about. So, all you scared to death Negroes, Just sit down. Yeah. Tell them. Don't you come out to defend our enemy. You sit down and you shut up and tell your master to come on out and deal with this. Now, let's go for the proof. The proof starts in the book of Genesis. Genesis, in the first five books of Moses, called the Pentateuch. Yes, sir begins with in the beginning. What beginning? When was that? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. Yes, sir. 
Mm. Interesting that God would reveal to Moses the beginning because Moses was 4,000 years ago, 2,000 years after the beginning. Because the beginning, according to the book, <laughs> is 4,000 BC. Moses came 2,000 BC, so there were 2,000 years that he had to get up to speed on. I thank Allah for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And soon every one of you will join me in thanking God for that man. It's talking about the relationship between heaven and earth. I'm just going to be brief, hit these points. Earth cannot function without heaven. There has to be a relationship between earth and heaven in order for life to come up out of the earth because without the heavens, nothing can come forth from the earth. The earth was without form and void. Something needed to be brought out that was without form and given form. Mm. So the Bible teaches us that Adam was made from the dust of the earth. But who was on the planet before Adam? Because certainly the beginning of humanity is not 6,000 years. Now you scholars, go look up the pre-Adamites. The pre-Adamites are the aboriginal people of our planet. The darker people. The original people. So the birth of Adam is the beginning of a new people that were existing in another kind of form, but without form. And through a process were brought out of the original man. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. They are not original man, they are mankind. A kind of a man from the original. Let us give them dominion, power to rule the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, and every creeping thing that crawls upon the earth. This is why it's very difficult for white people to submit to black leadership. because they were given dominion. And even though they act like they're submissive, yes, sir. you have to be careful because they're always looking for a way to undermine any black man that rises in authority. I'll get to President Obama in a short while. Now, 
In this book of Genesis, we get lots of pictures of God and his promise. Look at how this happens. In the 15th chapter of Genesis, God is talking to Abram. And he says to Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs and shall serve them and shall afflict them 400 years. But after that time, God is speaking, I will come and I will judge that nation which they shall serve and afterwards shall they come out with great substance and go to their fathers in peace and be buried in a good old age. Now the Jewish people claim that this is talking about them. But other than the Bible, there is no historical record of anybody named Jews in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. I remember when Menachem Begin was talking with Anwar Sadat of Egypt and he talked about how his people were in Egypt and had built the pyramids. And, and uh, I know, I didn't say Cronkite. I know who I'm talking about. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you for trying to help me. But in that instant, I didn't need it. But stay around. I might need it a little later on. <laughs> I never mention who was doing the interview because it's irrelevant. The fact is that Anwar Sadat said to Menachem Begin, we have no history of nothing like that in our history. That was a hint that Begin was trying to put something over on Sadat because there was a peace agreement. And you always have to think now that when you have peaceful relations, you have to keep your eyes open for the game that may be put over on you by a smart, crooked deceiver. Now, there's no historical record of their suffering in bondage like that. Now they were freed from a bondage all right, but that was in the hills and cave sides of Europe. This, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us, and you can go find it for yourself. Yes, sir. These people, have no legitimate connection to that land. They didn't come into existence in the Holy Land. They came into existence as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that Allah taught him on the island of Pilon or as it is written in the book of Revelation, Patmos. They came back to the Holy Land yes, after 600 years of grafting them from black into white. You that study biology, you so-called college students, this is a, almost a damn robbery to make you pay for an education that you can't use. The education has been factored 
and put before the world it is inferior teaching that leaves you still with it in an inferior position I'll prove what I'm saying in just a moment I'm not saying that you shouldn't go to school you shouldn't go to college but what I am saying is look at what you're studying don't waste your mother's money or your father's in a course that will not allow you to benefit your people or yourself so how did uh, they have any connection to the Holy Land. You see, after they came back to Arabia, which is the Holy Land, after the process was completed, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that within six months, yes, sir. they had turned the Holy Land upside down because they were taught a system of tricks and lies that would divide the family and it caused us to fight and kill one another because of the falsehoods that have been put between us this is 6,000 years ago now let's see if it's practiced today I was in Iraq I visited Shiite and Muslim uh, Sunni mosques I visited Christian churches I didn't visit the synagogue but they were there and nobody was bothering the next person you never read about a bombing of a mosque, bombing of a church, until after who got there. That's right. That's right. That's right. Talk to me. If it didn't happen under Saddam Hussein, and he was the tyrant, what happened now that there's killing between Shiite and Sunni? An enemy came in among you. They love to keep us at war with each other. But the architecture of white supremacy is to be exposed and destroyed. Moses had a hard job to civilize the Caucasian from the hills and cave sides of Europe. He did have another assignment after he got them up in Egypt, but not with them. You know, our lessons teach us that we rounded up all that we could find. And stripped from them everything except the language and drove them into the caves of Europe. Across the burning sand. So today, you want to join AKA or Delta, Sigma, Omega, Alpha, you got to do what? Cross what? Burning sand. Where did that come from? You want to become a Mason. Just trying to. But you got to cross the burning sand. 
Where did it come from? It came from your ancestors driving them out of the Holy Land into the hills and cave sides of Europe. But then the scripture says, the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. Well, how did fair get in there when all that area was black? Talk to me tonight. There were no white people in Palestine, in Saudi Arabia, in Iraq. All of that was black people, the original people. But race mixing began. Yes, sir. And then the blacks were moved out. When I was in Palestine, or what you call Israel today, as a guest of our Hebrew Israelite brothers in Demona, some of their scholars took me to Jerusalem and we went down to Jericho. And I saw a man riding on a donkey. He was very, very black. I could not speak his language, but our Hebrew Israelite brothers spoke to him in Hebrew. And uh, I asked the brother, ask him, how long has he been here on this land? He said, as far back as he can remember, he and his fathers and their fathers before them have always been on that land. Saudi Arabia, Saud, comes from the word Aswad, which means Black Arabia. How did it get white? Egypt! Cradle of civilization. Southern Egypt is where Cairo is. Northern Egypt is south because it follows the Nile River, which starts in Uganda and flows north. So everything at the north end of it is called, uh, that's called Upper Egypt. Now look. All of that was black. You go to Egypt, and some of you have been there, in that majestic desert, you see the Sphinx, you see a lion's body, and the head of a black man on a lion's body. Now some of them will tell you, no, we did that under slavery. Well, tell them that Farrakhan said, do it again. <laughs> because if you can't do it now, and you can't, you didn't do it then. This was a wise show of the great wisdom of our ancient fathers. Two things cannot rule at the same time. So when the new man came, which is the Caucasian, the black man had to go to sleep in order for the new man to rule. So when race mixing began, all these light-skinned ones. <laughs> you know how it began here, don't you? All us light-skinned ones. And then when you 
take the light one and he hates black and he marries another light one, then you get lighter ones. And before you know it, the lighter ones look nearly white and then they tell you they better than the blacker ones out of which all of them came. Now, if you're not teaching this in school, if you're not showing black people that they are the mother and the father of every human being on the earth, of every race on the earth, of every kindred, every tongue, and every nation, if you are not teaching this, then you're following the line of white supremacy and keeping your children ignorant that they can be used as a tool and a slave by the architects of white supremacy. Well, if they didn't do 400 years in Egypt, could it be that this was prophetic symbolic picture of a future people who would be the seed of Abraham. Teach it, teach it. Now, Jewish people claim Abraham. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I have to tell you the masquerade is over. Now listen. Uh, this is not this is not Jew Jew bashing. No, no sir. No, sir. I don't have nothing in my heart against the Jewish people, and I'll tell you in a minute why I admire them. But I have to tell the truth. Tell it. Tell it, dear minister. Tell it. Look. If they didn't suffer this, who did? Come on, minister. If God said to Abraham, look, man, I'm going to bless you. Now think about this. I'm going to bless you. Look to the north, look to the south, look to the east, look to the west. I'm going to give it all to you. That you can hold it forever. Oh, yeah. Boy, that's heavy stuff. And look at what he said to Abraham. If you can count the stars, so great will be the multiplication of the seed of Abraham. If you can count the dust, you'll be able to count the multiplication of your seed. Go ahead, minister. Well, from what I'm reading, Pat Buchanan said tell it, tell it. that the West is dying because the white race is not able to produce babies. And I just read something last week that the demographers in America are saying that by next year, possibly, the blacks and Hispanic babies will outnumber the birth of white children. Now, wait, 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 don't clap, think. Just think with me. That means that if this dearth of white babies, one child born, one white person dies. So you have an older and older generation of white people and a smaller young people, group of young people. The exact opposite is with us. So the wise demographers are saying, if this continues, by 2030, 2040, 2050, the whites will be the minority and the black and the brown will be the majority 
in America. I didn't say that. They're writing this. What do you think they are thinking? <clears throat> if they see you multiplying to the point where you will outnumber them. Why is there so much black on black killing? Why are they promoting birth control? Not for white people, but for you and Hispanic people, Native Americans. Why are they scientifically rendering you unable to produce <clears throat> the walls of your uterus now? so weak that you can't hold a child. So it's constant breakdown of miscarriage. Mm. You are living in the valley of the shadow of death. And if you don't understand, if you don't know how to save yourself under the plan of God for your salvation. You'll go down with the enemy as he goes down. Now, I want to stop a minute because some of you look like uh, you're in the wrong place. And... Yeah. No, wait, wait, wait. You know, when a man talks like this, yeah. you start thinking about what you might lose tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> the friends that's going to call you and ask you, was you there? <laughs> I heard you spoke. <laughs> but you can tell them I didn't know what that man was going to say. <laughs> but you can also tell them he's proven his point. Come on. And I'll tell you what you can tell them. You can get this book tonight. And when your friends start questioning you, say, would you read this? And this will be like showing a vampire the cross. <laughs> or throwing holy water on a vampire. See, because the worst thing that a deceiver wants is for the people deceived to find the truth. So listen, don't be afraid of what I'm saying. Don't block it out because of your friendships. I want you to have genuine friendships. Yes, All right, now let's get to the point. In Deuteronomy now, well, first, have we been here 400 years? Uh oh. Are we strangers in a land that is not ours? Have we been afflicted in this land every day of our sojourn here? Talk to me. Could it be that we are the people of the promise? Could it be that we are the people that should be expecting the visitation of God? Could it be that after all our suffering, that relief is in sight now? So in the book of Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter, the 18th verse, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, Moses. Moses was a civilizer. Moses took a man up out of the caves and made him upright. Moses taught him 
how to cook food, how to bury their dead. Moses lifted, as the Bible said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, yes, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. It's all about you. Yes, sir. Now, the Bible says, God talking, I'm going to put my words in his mouth. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Now, you can't have a man like Moses unless you have a people enslaved in a terrible condition. You can't have a man like Moses without a Pharaoh. You can't have a man like Moses except there is tyranny. And you can't have a man like Moses who's preaching integration. Oh, I got to say it again. See, Moses wasn't telling the children of Israel I want to integrate you into Egypt. Well, you can marry the sons and daughters of the Egyptians. Well, he's telling them, look, you tell Pharaoh what? Say it again. All right. So you can tell your Negro leaders ain't Moses. Now, I want our preachers to be careful because, see, when Moses started preaching, it was the elders among the children of Israel who opposed Moses because they wanted to be with Pharaoh because Pharaoh had promised them wealth and nearness to him and there's no slave that don't want to be near his master see the house Negro was always like that but the field Negro he understood house Negro say massa we house is in trouble Feel niggas say, let it go down. They not interested. But now, all right, let's move because I don't have a lot of time. And I don't want to frighten you so much that you won't be my friend after tonight. But I came here tonight, whether I left with a friend or all became enemies, I'm satisfied if I deliver the message because you're going to have to answer for what I say to you tonight. Yes, sir. Now look at this. Let's go to Isaac. Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren and the Lord granted his plea, and Rebekah conceived. Now, 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 listen to this. He was, she was having twins. And it says, but the children struggled together within her. Have you ever heard of anything like that in your life? You got twins and they inside struggling with each other. Now, does that make sense? And it must have a deeper significance. So let's get to the theology of it. And look what the Lord said. 
He said two nations are in your womb. God Almighty. From one father. Yes, sir. Two nations. Yes, sir. Then he said two peoples shall be separated from your body and one people will be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger. Now the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said the Bible is so tricked up that it takes God to interpret it. Even white folks look at it sometime and and say, we sure fixed it because we can't even understand what <laughs> fixed it. <laughs> the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, it's talking about the womb, the dark womb of the testicles of the black man that inside us is two, two nations. Yes, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad called it the black and the brown germ. Yes, that they were struggling yes. with each other. The black one was always dominant. Yes. So the brown germ stayed you know, like a negative thing inside you but always kept in control by the positive. He said, well, the first one came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over. So they called his name Esau. And afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. Now, wait a minute. Are you going to take hold of the baby's heel? He was struggling. Okay. Now... The Bible says that the older will serve the younger. See, it's talking about the beginning of the white race coming out of us. And they are the younger. We are the elder. But who's serving who? And they are naturally weaker. But the stronger is being subjected to the weaker. Let's go on. So Jacob was left alone, the Bible says, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. And when the man saw he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. And the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. All right. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Bless me. And the man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob. But your name shall be called Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Now talk to me. You know anybody that struggles with God and wins? <laughs> it must mean something here. The, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that this means Yaqub working with the life germ of the black man to bring out of that a new people. And it was a struggle. And he said, I have wrestled. My life has been preserved. Some scriptures say he wrestled with the angel of the Lord. Yes, sir. And he's called now 
the man who struggled with God. His hip was thrown out of socket. Have you ever had your hip thrown out of socket? Even if you prevail, you walking with a gimp walk. You need a cane. You need something to lean on to give you balance. Yes, wrestling with the angel means he wrestled with the germ of the black man until a new man came out and it was daybreak, meaning daybreak, it was the night of struggle. But when the darkness of the womb is exposed, then the baby comes forward into the light. A new people were being born on our planet to rule. And his name would be called Israel. Israel don't represent Jews. Israel represents the whole white race. You are the God, the original man, that he was struggling with. That's right. And ever since he's been on the planet, he's been struggling with God. All right, I'm going to move on. Ain't got time to go in all to that now. But now, God tells Abram, you know, how the people, his children, were going to sojourn in this land. And I will be with thee, and I will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed, I will give all these countries... And I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. See, the, the people that are in Israel today feel that that land, all of it is theirs because of this. That's why we want to sit down with their scholars, because it ain't them. That's right. That's right. That's right. See, Esau and Jacob now were the sons of Isaac. And when it was time for Isaac to die, he wanted to call his children to give a blessing. Rebecca heard what he said. Then she took Esau. Or rather, she took Jacob and dressed him up with hair, put the scent, yeah. made him even smell like his brother. <laughs> to deceive an old man whose eyes were dim. So the old man was wise enough, he said, well, wait a minute, come, come closer. And he was sniffing him. So she had put a scent on him that made him smell like his brother. Yeah. Then Isaac pronounced the blessing on Jacob. After a while, Esau came to get his blessing. He said, well, damn, I already gave it. To your brother, I can't take it back. But I'm going to give you a blessing. But this one, Jacob, he's going to rule. He's going to expand. He's going to be great. But you coming too. Now here's this Jacob stole the birthright of his brother. That's right. That's right. And here's a people that stole your birthright. And are running around like they are the chosen of God. And the choice of God is sitting under their foot. Yeah. 
would God choose a people that do the evil that they have done? They're not the choice of the God of righteousness. Ooh, that's, it's going to tough now. Hell may break loose in the morning. But look, it had to come. And we are prepared to defend what we say. And after 4,000 years of carrying our birthright, calling yourself what you know you are not, then when it's our time now to be blessed, as the real seed of Abraham. All right. Now, now who does this land belong to by the order of God? See, now look, let me just say this about God. Now people are living all over the planet. You've got six billion people on our earth. Everywhere on the earth is full of people. So if God is going to give us some land, somebody's going to have to be moved. Go ahead, dear minister. Yes, sir. Now, wait, wait now. Now, wait. Does God have the sovereign right over what he created? Does God have the right to take the kingdom from whom he pleases and give it to whom he pleases? Then if God pleases for you to have land, not a job, but some land that you can call your own to help God build the kingdom of God on earth. Bear with me a few more minutes, then we get to the heart of it. See, heaven and earth. John the Revelator said there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. The former things will pass away. It don't mean the new heaven up there and a new earth down here. It's talking about new spiritual leadership that will bring in new political leadership. Ooh. Now look, this is this is serious religion and politics. Because somebody going to have to move. Now you don't have to tell us go back to Africa. Don't start that talk. Because the man that came, the son of man that came, he asked us some questions. He asked us, what is the square mileage of the earth? How much is the land and how much is the water? He wasn't talking about no little holy land. Hell, the whole earth is going to be holy in a minute. Now, see, this book deals with the material power of the Jewish people. No one can deny 
they are the most magnificent people on our planet as we speak. Now wait just a minute. You got to give credit where credit is due. That's right, that's right. Yes, sir. That's right, sir. This is a special people. But the spiritual is what gives birth to the political. See, Theodore Herzl and the Zionist movement looked at scripture as a base for Zionist philosophy to take that land from the Palestinians. But they got it from the book. Mistaken understanding of the book. And you're going to pay for your error. Look. The dynamics of understanding the spiritual will guide the politics. You look foolish if you believe that you are the people of God and you begging white folk for a job. No, 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 no. And you can't see that your God like it was with Egypt, is curtailing the power of America to produce jobs. And if they can't produce jobs for their millions of unemployed, what makes you think they can produce a job for you? Your days of working for them are over. And the quicker you understand that you're going to have to get up and do something for yourself because they can't do it for you anymore because they can't anymore do it for themselves. Now, Y'all right? Yes, sir. Take a deep breath. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Take, no, no, just take a deep breath. In volume one of The Secret Relationship, it goes into the horror of the transatlantic slave trade. And the Jewish people were heavily involved in that. That's right. How many of you have been to Elmina Castle at yes, Cape sir. Coast in Ghana? Would you raise your hands? Yes, sir. If you were there 15 years ago, on the doors of the castle, you would see a Star of David. If you go there now, they took it down because they did not want you to understand the connection that they have to the transatlantic slave trade. It's all documented. I mean, with thousands of footnotes so that you wouldn't think we made this up. We quoted their scholars and showed you where you can go and get it for yourself. This is a scholarly work, not put together by nincompoops. I shared it with a few white people. And they said, I never knew that before. Do you know that many white people don't really know why you are in the condition that you're in? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself why immigrants could come here and in a few years run right past us and we've been here 
all this long? Is it because we're inferior or is it because the architecture of white supremacy is nobly at work to keep you in a position that you will never rise from? Well, we're going to see now, but you got to get the book. And you got to get, where, where's that one of how they sold us? I, didn't I have that one? Where is it? It's in the bag. Get it. Get it. A lot of stuff in the doctor's bag, you know. He, he just, he just checking the patient out to see what I can bring out for, as a prescription for ignorance. <laughs> At the back of this book, from the Jewish Encyclopedia. Quote, the cotton plantations in many parts of the South were wholly in the hands of the Jews, and as a consequence, slavery found its advocates among them. This little book that's on sale tonight shows you how they sold us. It wasn't just Gentile. No, no, no. These were the people. In fact, in Brazil, they said on a Jewish holiday, no slaves could be bought or sold because it was a holiday. So what does that tell you about slavery in Brazil? 80 million of us down there. They didn't come there on no free ship looking for something. They were brought there as slaves. You see us in the Caribbean? We didn't come there looking to sit in the sun and get a tan. Uh, brothers and sisters, the horror of the transatlantic slave trade and how the South became the leader in production of cotton and the Delta in Mississippi was the greatest cotton producing part of Earth on the planet. You see, uh, can give me a mic so I can walk a little. That's right. That's right. Can I, if I go to this board, we, right will they here. be able to see it? If I may? Here, here, here. Oh, I can just take the mic. Yeah, well, that's right. Time to start taking things that belong to us. <laughs> Now look, <clears throat> look at, look at this. Black folk picking cotton. Listen good now. Cotton was then what oil is now. The largest producer of oil in the world are the rich with rich ones and the strategic interests of America means in order for them to rule they have to link with where the oil is coming from and take it or maneuver to get it but they must have oil in the time of slavery it was cotton and it's interesting that the cotton would come down the Mississippi, New Orleans to the Gulf, from Biloxi, Mississippi, and from Mobile, Alabama, and the cotton would come down and go up to New York, where the brethren of the Jewish people in the South, in the North, were the masters of the needle trades. And they had their brothers also in the south taking the lint from the cotton and producing cloth through weaving. But these were Jewish people owning the land, 
They were the majority. They were the merchants. They were the traders. They knew how to hook up with their brethren in the north. And they would send raw cotton to the mills in England, in Manchester, Leeds, and Bristol. And the British would turn it into cloth and then sell it all over the world. So from cotton, the South became rich. From cotton, it fueled the Industrial Revolution in the North. From cotton, the Rothschilds became rich. From cotton, the Lehman Brothers became rich. From cotton in Alabama, then moved to New York and Wall Street. I know the truth, and somebody got to tell it or die trying. Put up the areas where the cotton was produced. Put it up. Put it up. I know the brothers, they, yeah, bless your heart. They'll find it. I hope I don't have to wait. Time is running. I want you to see where this cotton, <laughs> is that? No, that's not the one. That's not the one. Come on now. I can, it's all right, but it's not the one I'm looking for. Here you go. Now, this is cotton. North Carolina, Tennessee, South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, Texas. You see all these heavy black dots? Can you see them black dots? Those black dots represent Jewish bank owners and founders. Now look at, look at the dots. These heavy dots, Jewish banks. And you notice this dark spot here? That's the Mississippi Delta. <laughs> Let me tell you. Your brothers and sisters in Mississippi, my brothers and sisters, even right to this moment that I'm talking to you, some of our brothers and sisters are still in slavery in Mississippi, in Alabama, in Louisiana. Listen to me good now. You can't plead for their freedom. Ain't nobody gonna be angry with us for freeing our people from virtual slavery. There's a movie, a, a, a CD that I saw today. It's called The Cotton Picking Truth. We're still on the plantation. And a black woman is talking. She just got out of slavery in the 60s. Did you hear me? She talked about how they raped her mother. And she was five years old. And how they raped her. Oh, man. This is from her lips. People on large tracts of land in Mississippi, way out in the rural district, but our people sitting there, working there, living there with nothing. This woman says she lived in a barn. She had no place to lay her head. She was sleeping on hay. Oh, Lord. And she said she would eat crickets. Sometime there'd be a worm and she would bite a piece and give a piece of the worm to her children. Anything that came in front of them, they had to kill it in order to eat. 
This wasn't in 1850, 1860. This is in 1960. Let's go to this board again. All these dots that look like zeros, they were Jewish bank presidents, vice presidents. But these holy black dots are the bankers. Now you get that book, all of it is documented in there. We have the names of the bankers. Lord have mercy. See, the messenger of God said, anything you want to find is written in a book. But if we don't read, how will we know? The research society in the nation researched it. And now we're going before the world with it. Why? What's the purpose? I'll tell you that in a minute. You see all these little dots here? Little dots look like somebody got measles. See, these are the stores of the merchants on the plantation. That while you were working on the plantation, you couldn't buy from nobody but the owner of the store on the plantation. You would pick the cotton and you would get your bacon or whatever you needed from the store and they would write it down in a book and by the time the harvest season had come you go back to get your pay you find the manipulation of the books that you still owed money so you had to stay on the plantation listen they force black people back on the plantation it's going on now Just bear with me. Look, from these little stores, they became rich because everything the black person on the plantation needed, when slavery was over, they had to get it from the store. See, while we were in slavery, they give you a little something. But now look at this. 1863 was the Emancipation Proclamation, right? 1865, we're supposed to be free, 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment. Now, bless your heart, we are all citizens now. Something went wrong because after 12 years, from 1865 to 1877, 12 years, white folks said, quote, if the Negroes leave the land, we don't have nobody to work the land, and that's how we get our money. So we had to find a way to put the blacks back on the land. Listen to this. It's called the Compromise of 1877. This compromise can easily be listed among the most significant events in black American history. The country was in an uproar over the disputed election of 1876 involving presidential ri rivals Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel J. Tilden. But the root of the conflict was once again the fate of the black man. Since emancipation, the North had placed troops in the South <laughs> to keep the whites from putting the freed blacks back into plantation slavery. But after 13 years of this so-called reconstruction, whites all over the country, north and south, had grown tired and angry over fighting each other over the rights with their ex-slaves. 
both parties, Republican and Democrat, convened at the Wormley Hotel in Washington, D.C. to attempt to resolve the conflict. And on February 26th, 1877, a deal was struck that would profoundly affect the course of history for black people in America. All agreed that the country's need for cotton required that blacks be returned to virtual slavery and assigned to permanent political, social, and economic inferiority. You with me? All right. Let me get my papers here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Tell me I lost my papers now. But it don't make no difference. We got it anyway. Now, they made a deal in the Wormley Hotel that we had to be put back on the plantation. A Jewish man by the name of Levy, who was in Congress, was the spokesperson that went back to Congress to sell the idea of putting us back in the plantation. It's all here. And look at this. Putting us back on the plantation began what is called the Jim Crow laws. Now, Jim Crow started with a white, um, a white minstrel. You know, he, he was a dude that would put on blackface and make mockery of us in dances, you know. No, he, yeah, no, no, we ain't got to Joseph yet. But he was imitating us, and he was, it was called Jim Crow. Jim Crow. So Jim Crow became the name that was used to put us back on the plantation. Now check this out. L William Levy was entrusted to sell the deal to Congress and to assure his fellow Southerners that their interests had been protected. His entire speech to Congress is preserved in the Congressional Record, March 1st, 1877. A Jew was chosen to advocate in Congress for the permanent inferiority of the black man and woman in America, and this is what makes this event extremely significant in the history of black Jewish relationships. Now, putting us back on the plantation, it was so skillfully done, but did you know that when they let us out of slavery, we were all the tradesmen. White folk didn't do that kind of work. Now listen to this. You remember James Weldon Johnson? The great poet that wrote the black national anthem? Listen to what he said. All the most interesting things that came under my observation were being done by colored men. They drove the horse and mule teams, they built the houses, they laid the bricks, they painted the buildings and fences, they loaded and unloaded the ships. When I was a child, I did not know that there existed such a thing as a white carpenter or bricklayer or painter or plasterer or tinner. The thought that white men might be able to load and unload the heavy drays of the big ships was too far removed from everyday life to enter my mind. 
It was indeed said that if a white man were even seen in public doing any form of skilled labor, he would draw a crowd of gawking onlookers. Now just think about you now. Think, think with me, please. Noted Southern writer Thomas Nelson Page concurred. The black man, he said, was without a rival in the entire field of industrial labor throughout the South. 95% of all the industrial work of the southern states was in his hand, and he was fully competent to do it. Every adult was either a skilled laborer or a trained mechanic. 95%. Did you know that slaves were on loan to Washington to build the White House, to build the Capitol building, to build the Lincoln Memorial and the Jefferson Memorial? White folk weren't the builders. You were the builders. And when slavery ended, we would have had all the jobs building, moving north to build. So they didn't want that. So they put us back on the plantation. Well, Rothschild had an agent called August Belmont. His real name was Schoenberg. But like many do, they changed their names. Rothschild's representative in America changed his name from Schoenberg and managed Rothschild's investment in slave-produced cotton, tobacco, and other products. The famous Belmont Stakes horse race is named for him because he was an avid fan of horse riding. Now, here's the rub. When white folks saw that we were the tradespeople, we knew it all. A Jewish man by the name of Samuel Gompers started the American Federation of Labor. And that union was founded not to give you a job, but to keep you from working. Then they opened the floodgates of immigrants from Europe. And the tradespeople from Europe began coming in, pushing you further and further out so that today you are not represented in none of the trades like you were listen to me and in those days a father would teach his son but today you grow up knowing nothing about carpentry nothing about bricklaying nothing about building Hiram You've been hit in the head by a, a master thief. You are the builder. You are the people of the builders of civilization. But many of the Jews were shriners. George Washington was a shriner. Many of your early presidents were Masonic people, Shriners. I know you joined the Lodge. You might as well come this way. Because what they gave you, you ain't built a damn thing. 
I hate to talk like this. But hell, if I don't, who will? You don't know no black man that's bold enough to say this. Even if you think it, you won't say it. But I know God. And it is he whom I fear. The black man must go free in the Delta, in Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, Texas, Louisiana. Now, y'all all right? I hope I'm not scaring you. But you know what? The Bible says the fearful and the unbelieving will have their part in the lake that burns with fire. If you are afraid, you're already on your way to hell. God has come to take fear out of us. You don't need to be afraid. And if you challenge what you're afraid of, you find they will become afraid and back away from you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. All right. We're winding up. Now look. Do we do business like business should be done? Let me hear an answer. In the word business is the word busy and when you're busy you're engaged in some focused activity business is the activity of life itself when you are a living organism you must be engaged in that which preserves and maintains your life. There is no creature that God created that is not busy feeding, sheltering, procreating, extending itself. If we are a living people, see, inanimate objects don't do this. They don't procreate. They don't go looking for food or shelter. They're inanimate, meaning they're not living. But what about you? Ever since we've been in America, we haven't provided food, clothing, shelter, education for ourselves and our people. Am I lying? You graduated from Mohouse, Clark, Howard, Tuskegee, Florida A&M, North Carolina A&T. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have degrees. What have we produced? Of food? Of clothing? Of shelter? For our people. If you find as a living creature that you need something that you don't have, you look around for somebody that has what you need and you enter into trade and commerce as a living people. But you are not alive. You are dead people. You have flatlined on business.
Now, if you look at all the people of the earth, the ones that are the most busy, showing that they have the most life, are the members of the Jewish people. Why are they this way? Because they had the prophets. And they learned well. Now, I'd like to read you something that uh, I, I found in, in this book. It talks about the percentage of Jews in America, but the number of Nobel laureates, their percentage outweighs everybody's. They are the best in science, in medicine, in law, in art, in culture. It's a tremendous people. How did they get it? Through trade and commerce. Our lessons tell us that they set up a trading post. See, they understood the value of commerce. We haven't got it yet. You got brothers and sisters all over the world that you can do business with but we have no commerce or trade with the peoples of the earth and we sit around in America looking to white people to give us a job listen you're dead you're like inorganic matter That's why our young people are so bitter and so angry because they came into a world and we prepared nothing for them. You telling them stay in school for what? To come out like you? You're angry with them because they found unity in a gang. Because there was no unity in the house. They're justifiably angry and defiant. Because we, their parents, have produced nothing for them that will give them a future. So the traitor always disappears. Did you know that the Jewish people got their real business skill from the Babylonian Talmud that taught them the science of business? Do you know that in Europe, in every nation where they were, they led in industry, in commerce, in trade, in banking. And the Gentiles were angry with them because everywhere they went, they ruled. So the Gentiles rose up against the Jews and persecuted them in Europe. But when they came to America, they went into the South. And there, they found common ground with the Gentiles who hated black people. Because that same Babylonian Talmud, the rabbis developed the myth of Ham. That you and I are the children of Ham, cursed black doomed to be hewers of wood and drawers of water for white people. So when they got in the south, they just fueled the Gentiles with the curse of Ham. And that has spread throughout the world. 
it has poisoned the bloodstream of Islam, of Christianity, of Judaism, of communism, of socialism, wherever black and white are, they feel the, the entitled position to rule. We really need to study the architecture of white supremacy and what happened to us as a people. Well, you can get all of that in the book and I think now I would like to close. Did you know that we're still sharecropping? Wait now. You might be surprised when I call your name. <laughs> See, today the, the Jewish people have developed a new strategy. They have always tied themselves to black people. When we move north, they moved. They bought the ghetto and they owned the houses and gave us houses. They rented us. They fed us. They gave us insurance. You know what they did. Yes, sir. Then they moved out. What is the American dream? You say you got it? See, the American dream is when an immigrant can come here and in a short amount of time build a community have everything they need to be self-respecting and self-independent. And we are still here. And how do they do it? They come to us. They offer you. Well, look at the Koreans. They're here now. Do you need hair? Of course you do. I'm not trying to be funny. But you know that whale that was in, the, in San Diego somewhere that caught that young lady by her ponytail and crushed her, you know, killed her? That wouldn't have been you, would it? They caught you by that ponytail. They'd have just yanked that bad boy off. <laughs> you, just, well, just a little levity. That's a little laugh, you know. But let's get back to serious business. I'm going to close. Look, my dear, beloved. All of our entertainers, see, we have the talent. They have the expertise. They attach themselves to our talent. They are the managers, the agents, and they are the accountants. And that's why our black artists loved fame and got fame, but died poor because somebody else got their money, sent their children to the finest schools, and are able to continue to rule while you pass on nothing to your children but the legacy of your fame and nothing else. But today, they've developed a new strategy. Let's make our Negroes rich. A new strategy. The old strategy was let them die broke. Or they take you, you know when you first start singing, you're in what they call the chitlin circuit. You all know about that? And then as you get famous in the chitlin circuit, they finally put you in a supper club and you cross over and you get new management, you know, and then they take you to after parties and you meet 
A beautiful white girl. Did I say something wrong? And the next thing you know, you've ditched your black wife and have you a white one. And when you die, like poor Gary Coleman, there's a woman pulled the plug the first day. Don't stay, you might come back out. This nigga's worth more to me dead. Pull the plug. Mm. Poor Tiger. You know, he ain't black. You know, he's a Cablanasian. <laughs> Whatever the hell that is. The greatest ball player that ever did it, golfer. And the girl that he married was a nanny, I understand. A nanny. And his man making billions. And he married a nanny. Uh, now the poor fella now she rich for the rest of her life with her beautiful mulatto children and now he's struggling to hit the ball right You're crossing over now. Bless your heart. But the money goes back to them. Now, they have uh, my brother, Russell Simmons. He wrote a beautiful piece on black Jewish relations and I'm here to tell you no black man or woman becomes a multi-millionaire without friendship in the Jewish community I'll prove it in a minute did you know <laughs> I'll get back to oh Lord there's so much to give you but I can't do it all did you know that nearly all prominent Negro actors and musicians have or had Jewish sponsors and managers? Florence Mills, Ethel Waters, Paul Robeson, Duke Ellington, Cap Calloway, Adelaide Hall, Valeda Snow, Bojangles, Hattie McDaniels, Steppen Fetchett, Rochester, Chilton and Thomas and the Mills Brothers, the Ink Spots, just keep naming them. See, so they have a way of attaching themselves to your gifts, but you get nothing. They get it all. Now they've decided, you know, we, we, we have to change this. New strategy. Our brother, Russell Simmons, is a multi, multi-millionaire. He's a good brother. And he has great friendship with the Jewish people. Miss Oprah, a beautiful woman with a beautiful heart, a multi billionaire. But there's a Jewish man that helped guide her career and make her who she is. P. Diddy, Jay-Z, just name them. Even in hip-hop, Jews manage most of the black hip-hop artists. And man, I got something 
I can't do it now. But they end up with nothing. They come with the bling bling and a nice car and they show you that they're successful. But if you could see the breakdown of the record deals, they end up with nothing. As I said in my lecture, the crucifixion of Michael Jackson, yes, he was asset rich and cash poor. So you, if you're going to sell your assets, then you can get liquid. If you don't want to sell your assets, then you borrow against your assets. So the Jewish person with money was always there to loan Michael money. Because Michael was smart enough to buy the catalog of Elvis Presley and the Beatles is worth a billion dollars. So he had it. They were trying to get it from him. He had Neverland. They were trying to get it from him. So he, was, he, he loved nice things, so he spent money because he had it. But then when he needed to save his property, he had to borrow. Now, what is the strategy? See? I have a list of all the NBA owners. See, it's like a plantation. <laughs> you just a piece of meat throwing balls in hoops. They got dogs. They can do that. And they go in the hoop. Now you the best at doing it. So you on a plantation. But you rich. A rich slave. You sharecropping again. LeBron James sharecropper. Now I'm not downing my brother. But he's being used. And as long as he can play like he plays, they want him in Cleveland, they want him in New York, they want him in Chicago, they want him in Miami. So he's good meat, you know. Boy, in this book here, you should see the way they sold us. We have a nigga, 22 years old, strong, skilled in carpentry. We have a nigga wench. How did she get to be sold? She owed her rent and couldn't pay it, so they put her on the block and sold her. It's all here. Look at you today. You can't see how you tore up. You want a home, don't you? Everybody wants a home. So they made it possible for you to get one. No money down. No, all you do is pay interest. How in the hell could you accept a deal like that? In three years, the interest now goes up. You didn't see that in the fine print. Now you're in foreclosure. It's a trick. Who's behind it? Wall Street. Who are they? Well, they didn't just do it to you. They did it to America. I know this is rough. Did you know that in 1913, when the Federal Reserve Act was made, America was $2 billion in debt. Less then a hundred years later, she's $13 trillion in debt. How did all that happen? Now the country is like the, the, the sharecroppers working to pay off debt. 
China got America, Japan got America, other people just loaning America money, and here comes Brother Obama. Now look, do you love your brother? Yes, I do too. Do you know that he was nurtured for this position? <laughs> Dr. Larry Muhammad, who is the director of the Universities of Islam, before he came to run the schools of the nation, he was in charter school business. And there was a Jewish philanthropist who told him nearly five years ago that by 1988, Barack Obama would be president of the United States. And do you know when our brother was elected, 2008, I'm sorry, Jewish people wrote as Bill Clinton was the first black president, Barack Obama would be the first Jewish president. Now that's a terrible thing to say, but they were telling you we own the brother. His early money came from Goldman Sachs. He was nurtured by Jews who saw in him his brilliance. Tell it, tell He's it. a beautiful human being. Tell it. And they knew that as brilliant as he was, they could use him to trick black people away from the promise of God. He's not a willing participant in madness. But Satan understood the time. And he knew that this was the right man for the time. They selected him, and what could we do? We had to vote for our brother because he was the best thing we ever saw. He's president now, and he's upsetting them. Because all the Jewish presidents met him in the Oval Office and told him to go easy on Israel and settlements in the West Bank. And because he was strong, out of Israel they started calling him what they've been calling me. An anti Semite. Y'all with me? Look here. No, I don't have a lot of time, but I do try to take it. I, I don't mean to wear you out. But I, I, I want you to hang with me. Because now, our brother is being beaten up like they've never done another president before him. They're angry with him because he's not towing the Israeli line. I have in my possession a letter written by Senators Reed and McConnell and by congresspersons signed by 87 senators 
and 380 something congressmen, over 400 members of Congress appealing to the president not to cave in to what happened to the flotilla from Turkey that were bringing relief to the blockaded people of Palestine and Gaza. They told him in words, hang tough and veto anything in the United Nations that comes up condemning Israel. I don't know what he's going to do, but I looked at the list of who signed it. You don't have no real representatives. You know that, don't you? All your representatives, for the most part, are bought and paid for. They will fight for you up to a point. Now I'll have to let you go. Listen, listen. President Obama can't talk about reparations. Can't talk. Can't talk. Can't talk. He's not going he ain't bringing that up. No sir. No sir. I have here a letter that I wrote to Abraham Foxman. With a copy to the President of the United States and all the leading members of uh, the Jewish community. Yeah. And soon it'll be on the desk of uh, all our college presidents and members of Congress. But, brother, would you do me a favor? Put up that ferry with all that cotton on it. If you can find it while I'm ending this. Uh, look, let, let me go over there a minute. Look here. You see these bales? Black people pick this cotton and got less than 50 cents per bale. And white folk got millions. And that's why they can, through trade and commerce, they can lead in mathematics and science because their money puts them where they want to go. Now let me ask you a question. Do you think after making America rich and strong and fighting in all her wars, making Europe strong, do you think that we are owed reparations for what we have done to make America what America is. If you think so, stand up on your feet. All punks sit down. <laughs> sit. Well, all right. If that's what you think, and there are black people right now in Mississippi in slavery, in Alabama in slavery, and a black man is appealing to Congress to right this wrong, he can't get a hearing. We got over 400,000 black men and women in the United States Armed Forces. What are they doing in Iraq? What are they doing in Afghanistan when our fight is here? So look, 
the time has come when we have to present a solid case to America. They have no jobs for us. They don't intend to look after us. God has said, he raised the question in Isaiah, shall the prey be taken from the mighty and the lawful captive be delivered? You are a lawful captive that is being used as a hostage. But as you see the plagues now striking America, one town was overrun with flies. Another was overrun with frogs, rain, hail, snow, earthquakes. Now after I leave you today, God is going to put an exclamation point behind this lecture and a calamity of great magnitude is going to strike America. I am my father's helper. You don't need to look for no Moses. Elijah Muhammad is that Moses. And I am his Aaron and his Joshua. You don't need to look for your Jesus. He's the first begotten of the dead. You on a dead level. Elijah was raised from you, and I am to him what Paul was to Jesus. The Jews may not like me because the Jews didn't like Jesus. And they began to argue with Jesus as they're going to soon argue with me. Over what? We the children of Abraham. But Jesus said, to the Jews, if you were the children of Abraham, you would be found doing the works of Abraham. They said, we are from God. God is our father. But Jesus said, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. I say to the Jews, if you are the seed of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. He was a just man. He was a righteous man. He was an upright man. He was neither a Christian nor a Jew, for he predated the Torah and the gospel. We are the seed of Abraham. We are the children of divine promise. We are the people that God has visited and we are the people that God has promised land and he will fight this enemy for your freedom. Thank you for listening and may Allah bless you. Yeah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, all praise is due to Allah. For the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. If you misunderstood me, I said he met with the president of the major Jewish organizations in the Oval Office in the White House. Not Jewish presidents, but the presidents of major Jewish organizations. Now, it's nearly 400 that signed the letter. I have their signatures. Well, family? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, brother. Yes, brother. I thank all those who are listening by radio. I thank all those who were not afraid and turned their radio off. 
Now, you ought to know, you ought to know that a lecture like this has put me in deep trouble with those forces that run this world. I have never been more prepared in my life to do what it takes, even if it's to free you. But I can tell you, they killed their last prophet when they killed Jesus. But Jesus, the Messiah, they can't have him. The Messiah is not 2,000 years ago. He's today. He comes at the end of the world of the wicked. As the Bible teaches you, God's coming is after the workings of Satan. Revelation 2 and 9. Those who say they are Jews and are not, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. So be careful of what church you belong to today. Make sure you belong to the church of Jesus Christ, that one who is bringing in the kingdom of God. May God bless each and every one of you. May God guide you and protect you. And I pray that if there's any fear in your hearts, that Allah will remove that fear because right now your enemies are trembling. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because if this truth is in your hand and you are willing to share it with them, you'll see them. Try feebly to defend it, but there is no defense. I wrote them and told them there's two things that they can do. I said, we are armed with the truth, and we could charge you with being the most virulent anti-black group parading as a friend, but acting through this book as our worst enemy. We thank God for those Jews who would befriend the black man and those Gentiles who hear what I'm saying. Stop looking over there. If there's something you want to do to get a blessing, help me. Go ahead. to help free our people. Listen, 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 listen. It's written in the Quran that Allah took a covenant with all of the people to whom he sent a prophet that when that one comes who is found written in the Torah and the gospel that you should help him. I represent that one. I am an extension of that one. And even though he is not here, I am here to represent him. So if you help me lift this black man up from his degraded state and help me to civilize him and put him on the road to building a nation, then the judgment of God will be kept back from you but the window of opportunity for you, America, is very, very short. I said, now you can marshal your forces and come against me and the nation of Islam with all you got. I said, but if you take that route, Allah God, and his Messiah yes, sir. 
the Honorable Elijah Muhammad will bring you to disgrace and ruin, destroy your power and your influence in America and throughout the world. I don't have any power. Just a minute. I don't have any power to fight these people except the power of the word. It's not me. It's who's backing me that you should be afraid of. I'll say it again. It is not I. And if you want to test to see if I am backed by God. No, no, no. No, serious. God had me doing this as a dare. I dare you. It's written in the book of Psalms. Touch not my prophets and do my anointed no harm. He sits in heaven and laughs at you. And I'll be around till he makes all my enemies my footstool. I'll walk on you. So if you want to show who got God with him, Bring all your forces and come against me. And I, with the backing of my God and his Christ, will defeat you all. You can take it or let it alone. One more time, assalamu alaikum. Brothers and sisters, let us hear it. For the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan here in Atlanta, Georgia. Let us now be still. Let us not break apart before we close with prayer. Let us bow our heads where we are. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the Beneficent, the Merciful, Master of the day of judgment in which we now live. Thee alone do we serve, and to thee alone do we beseech for help. O Allah, guide us on the right path the path of those upon whom you have bestowed favors, not the path of those upon whom your wrath is brought down, nor of those who go astray after they have heard 